and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together for a clean energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter, energy attorney and principal of Imagine Power LLC. It has been said that elections have consequences and the election of Donald Trump will have impacts on clean energy development in Hawaii, in the United States, and throughout the world. Donald Trump, the candidate, has said that he will withdraw from the historic Paris Climate Agreement. And he has also said that he will support fossil fuel development. So what does a Trump administration mean for you here in Hawaii if you have a clean energy company, own clean energy assets, work in clean energy, or just care deeply about um, averting climate change? Today, we will be talking with two people in the know about what's next for clean energy in Hawaii and on the mainland when Donald Trump takes the wheel in 2017. I am pleased and honored to be joined in the studio by Isaac Morawaki with Earth Justice here in Hawaii. Isaac is an attorney with over a decade of experience litigating before federal and state courts and agencies on a range of issues, including environmental health and clean energy. He works tirelessly for a just and clean environment here in Hawaii. Welcome and thank you for coming, Isaac. Thank you for inviting me and having me on the show. Absolutely. We are also joined via Skype by Carl, Carl Robigo, Executive Director of the Pace Energy and Climate Center at the Pace Law School in White Plains, New York. Carl is also a lawyer by training and has over 25 years experience in the energy and climate field. He has been Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Energy, a Commissioner at the Texas Public Utility Commission, and has held various senior positions in utilities, energy companies, and think tanks. He's also a U.S. Army veteran, Ranger, and Airborne qualified. Welcome, and thank you so much, Carl, for being with us today. It's a great, great pleasure to join you, Raya, and you, Isaac, in this discussion. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Um, I just, this is, I think, uh, very excited and happy to have you guys here. Um, I think after the election, I think we all understand that there was, you know, there were expectations. A lot of the polling was wrong. Um, I think a lot of folks thought that Hillary Clinton had this in the bag. And a lot of the climate, uh, and in, the climate and environmental activists, I think, were sort of looking at the Hillary Clinton platform and thinking, you know, this is the way we're going to move forward. Um, however, that was not the case. I think it was a big surprise to a lot of people. And uh, I'm just excited that you guys are both here to join because I think that folks are really looking for um, thought leadership um, and even just moral support at this time. So. I really, I'd just like to start things very broad and ask the both of you. I'll, I'll start with you, Carl, um, on Skype. Uh, what in terms of broad energy trends can we expect with renewable energy in a Donald Trump administration? Who the heck knows? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I've actually spent a lot of time talking with friends and with reporters and other people in the energy policy area. And it's really hard to knit together a coherent strategy there. We've got some sound bites. Um, we've got some one-liners from the campaign trail, but, but we really don't know much more than that. And you know, one of my pet peeves about this entire election is that sound bites and one-liners substituted for meaningful policy discussion. So it's gonna be really hard to have a meaningful policy debate until we see some more flesh on the bones. But what do we know? Well, we do know that he also swept Republicans into leadership in Washington, and they have had an agenda. Um, sometimes it's been supportive of clean energy. Sometimes it's been more supportive of fossil fuels, coal and oil and natural gas interests. We do know that a lot of Mr. Trump's voters were um, uh, Tea Party type people, libertarians, you know, working class, and um, those people are real strong states' rights supporters. They uh, live and breathe, they understand what the Tenth Amendment says. Many Tea Party people can quote the Tenth Amendment to you. And um, so in that regard, notwithstanding the Republican leanings, there might be reason to believe that a Trump administration won't interfere with the state trying to take care of its people. 
Very interesting. Thank you for that, Carl. Um, Isaac, do you have thoughts, sort of general thoughts, on energy um, and uh, what, the, what the Trump administration may bring? Well, I think any reason for optimism, as far as someone, uh, you know, advocates wanting some sort of control on this careening problem we have with climate change, um, the shift from fossil fuels to clean energy, I think reason for optimism kind of went out the window as we're finding who's on Trump's transition team. And maybe, Carl, you can touch on this a little bit more, too. But you know, there's this, about that. this character about. that's going to be taking over uh, the transition for EPA, um, who's basically just this, this character uh, and his resume reads kind of like something out of uh, The Simpsons or whatever, you know, uh, Smithers, uh, or sorry, Mr. Burns. Um, and so a notorious climate denier. Um, and right along the lines of what Trump was saying on, on the campaign trail, thinking that uh, climate uh, change is a hoax. And so th this does not bode well as far as, directionally speaking, where we're headed as a nation in terms of dealing with climate change and you know, moving from fossil fuels to clean energy. Uh, all right, that it's discouraging, but Carl, <laughs> let me let me but thank you, Carl. Let me ask you. You have worked in the Department of Energy as a, a serious thinker and as the many brilliant scientists that we have in the Department of Energy. Um, what would that mean for a uh, a climate denier um, right. to be at the helm of the of the EPA, as Isaac was talking about? Right. So um, several layers to this particular onion. First of all, the Department of Energy and the EPA have cooperated throughout the last, gosh, 24 years on advancing clean energy, especially voluntary clean energy initiatives, especially state-run clean energy initiatives. So putting um, a climate denier in there, we're not sure what it means in terms of program administration, in terms of the enforcement, in terms of following the law. You know, our our clean power plan came out of an act of Congress in a Supreme Court decision that said that when once the EPA found that there was, you know, harm to human beings, they had to regulate on carbon dioxide. That, that doesn't change just because the guy in the top office has got his fingers in his ears, right? So um, he can't, he, uh, you know, just to say, is it, is it, climate, climate is science and science don't care you know, what party, science don't care about politics. Science is about the facts. Uh, one more thing that's really important too, DOE, big agency, but most people don't know that 80% probably of the Department of Energy's budget is on nuclear weapons storage and nuclear waste management. Um, that it was born out of the Atomic Energy Commission. They do a certain amount of research and development. They've been doing some great work to support solar deployment and wind deployment recently, in the last eight years especially, um, actually a little longer. But um, most of what's going on there, whoever they, you know, I heard there was an oil or a gas man being considered for the Department of Energy. That guy is going to find himself having to deal with the intricacies of nuclear stockpile management. And he's going to have a whole lot of time to mess around the edges. Last point, um, what's at stake? What's at stake is our leadership. The world knows climate change is a problem. The world knows that the science is right. The world is ready to follow a leader on addressing these issues. The leader of the energy economy could be us, but if we put no nothings in charge of those agencies, the world will still have a leader. It just won't be the United States. Thank you for that, Carl. That leads me to uh, my next question, and I'll go ahead and ask you, Isaac, when we talk about international leadership on climate change um, and averting catastrophic climate change. Uh, Trump, the candidate, has says, said that he wants to withdraw from the um, Paris Climate Agreement that um, uh, was reached in December. Uh, now we're at, that was COP21, now we're at literally right now, COP22 is happening. What would it mean for the U.S. to pull out of the Paris Agreement? Um, well, it goes to Carl's point about leadership. It's, it would be basically 
the U.S. abdicating um, any form of leadership in this, what's becoming a global movement, uh, maybe even a seat at the table, you know, becoming a renegade nation in the community of nations and saying, look, you know, look, like Carl said, fingers in the ears, la la la, we're not going to be dealing with this. Uh, and then it's up to the rest of the nation, maybe China, um, to take the leadership and then, you know, hopefully things don't descend into an anarchy. Um, real quick regarding the point about science, uh, I agree, you know, in this modern age, we believe science wins out, the facts uh, matter. Uh, but we've seen, like, for example, in previous administrations, the George W. Bush administration, um, the violence that can be done uh, to science by just rank politics. And, and I fear, uh, and again, you know, waning optimism, but we'll see um, what's going to happen to science under this administration, which is like basically George W. Bush on steroids or maybe George W. Bush meets reality television. Yeah, uh... I think Isaac makes a, a critical point there, and I don't, I'm not um, poly, being a Pollyanna about this. Uh, everybody talking about this has said we're at or critically close to a tipping point. We can't afford to lose four years, much less eight. So there's no cause for complacency. Um, and I'm, in, I'm sort of enjoyed to see a lot of people in the environmental community a lot of you know smart scientists and lawyers getting together to talk about how they're going to deal with these situations notwithstanding a trump administration but um the good news is that uh, it, they don't wield you know absolute power and waning power in the community of nations let me ask the clean the clean power plan was intended to be sort of america's um enforcement system or contribution to the reduction of global, green, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Carl, where are we with the Clean Power Plan and what can we expect from the Clean Power Plan under the Trump administration? Yeah. So people who haven't been nerding out on it like some of us here on the <laughs> show, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the EPA did publish a final rule and it reflected by and large the trends going on in the industry, meaning that uh, Coal plants are closing, no one's building new ones. Natural gas is the fuel of the day and renewables are coming along at a record pace. They use that information to set a standard that really becomes a kind of a floor for what utilities will do when they make electricity. And it basically says that state of the art is modern natural gas facilities. And you, if you're gonna have any of those old coal units, you better balance them out with some new renewables. That's pretty much what the plan says. But it's important to note that in most states, like in New York where I'm living now, um, it's this clean power plan is kind of the floor. Clean power plan doesn't make New York do anything because New York's well on the way. We already have a regional agreement with several other states to cooperatively work to reduce greenhouse gases. And our governor has taken a strong leadership, just like there in Hawaii, to take to, to lead the state far beyond it's preserving that right for the states to go above and beyond the clean power plan floor that's our most vital issue of the day thank you so much for that and i i think we're going to head to a break and after i'd like to ask you isaac on your thoughts of the clean power plan and what that means for um hawaii going forward on renewable energy Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha, see you then. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. We highlight success stories in Hawaii of both businesses and individuals. We learn their secrets to success, which is always valuable. I hope to see you on our next show. Aloha. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. Hello, welcome back.
to Power Up Hawaii. I am Raya Salter, your host, and I'm here today talking about what's next for clean energy in a Trump administration with Isaac Morwake of Earth Justice Hawaii and Carl Robigo, director of the Pace Energy and Climate Center at Pace Law School in New York, who's joining us by Skype. We were just talking about the Clean Power Plan, which are the rules that um, were um, intended to be the mechanism that was going to enable the United States to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the ener energy and utility sector and make um, global con uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, globally. Um, I was go just going to ask Isaac, you know, in light of what Carl has said about if, in, if indeed um, the clean power plan is scuttled by a by a, um, and you can speak to the legal status by either a Supreme Court or by the Trump administration. Um, in light of the fact that with Carl's point about sort of states being empowered to still be progressive and move forward, right. um, what do you think this will mean for Hawaii, if anything? Well, uh, briefly on the status of the Clean Power Plan, it's now sort of pending in the courts, and so it's in limbo there. Uh, and then, of course, the Trump administration can come in and, and maybe withdraw it or, or change it or weaken it. Carl mentioned before, there is a backstop there. Uh, you know, I don't think the Trump administration can completely say we're not going to do anything with regards to climate regulation because there already has been on the books a finding that there's endangerment um, due to you know, climate pollutants. Okay? So the EPA has to do something, of course. There's a world of possibilities in terms of what the Trump administration can do to do nothing or do very little. Okay. Um, now, with regards to the Clean Power Plan and its effects on Hawaii, bringing it home here, I agree with Carl completely that that was uh, the Clean Power Plan is just a floor, and frankly, not a very high one uh, under the circumstances, especially what we need to achieve to get the job done in terms of getting a handle on climate um, change. Uh, and as far as Hawaii goes, re realize. Hawaii was completely exempt from the Clean Power Plan uh, because the EPA hadn't gotten around to figure out what they should do with Hawaii. Uh, and even in the draft plan, Hawaii was only given a target of like something like 10% renewables when we've already achieved upwards of 23% already, right, you know, today. Uh, and so the Clean Power Plan wasn't going to do much for Hawaii or a lot of other leading states like New York and California. Uh, and so regardless of what the Trump administration does, um, uh, on the Clean Power Plan, it's still full speed ahead here in Hawaii, and as everyone knows, we have a 100% renewable goal here uh, under state law. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that. I want to ask another question about um, what we can expect or not expect from the federal government, um, and that is tax, tax credits for clean and renewable energy. Um, and I'll go ahead and ask you, Carl, where does the industry still need these credits? Um, are they in peril in a, in a Trump administration? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, there is some risk of this. Uh, serious people are wondering. Uh, there's an expectation that with the Republicans maintaining their majority and with some of the, like, the sound bites that Mr. Trump has made during the campaign and some of the people he's talking about for his transition, that there'll be some kind of energy bill introduced in the Congress, maybe even in the lame duck set, set, uh period between now and the inauguration. And there is a concern that, in, um, that Republicans will try to cut the production tax credits and investment tax credits that renewable energy development receives. Um, it would be one-sided probably because there are of course a lot of tax breaks for fossil energy and you know doing things the old way which would leave the, be left in place. I'm heartened a little bit I've worked this issue on the Hill when I was in, you know, private industry and stuff, and Republicans in general were supportive. I also don't think that tax credits for renewable energy, which produces so many jobs in the states that voted for Mr. Trump, um, is, is something that his supporters would want cut, because as we've seen, bad energy policy leads to fast and many layoffs. Uh, especially in the booming solar and wind energy industries. So it's a possibility. It's, it's a question how much Mr. Trump will let the Republicans advance a kind of a quiet agenda to cripple clean energy, the Koch brothers agenda, the ALEC agenda, 
to try to bolster the coal industry. Um, but I'm I'm hopeful that cooler heads will prevail. I even remember reading at least one insider story saying that the Trump administration wasn't going to go after those tax credits. I wouldn't expect to ask for any more tax credits, but I'm feeling that um, there's reason for cautious optimism. All right. Thank you so much for that, um, Carl. Isaac, what are your thoughts? The as um, as we know, the solar industry has been has been booming um, in Hawaii. Um, recently, um, some recent decisions um, and actions taken have um, perhaps, according to some, sort of um, cooled off the solar industry. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. But but what do you think in terms of either signals or practical effect that? Um, uh, tax credits at risk could have for the um, renewable energy industry here in Hawaii? Yeah, first of all, in terms of the prospects of a change to the tax credits on the federal level, um, I've been hearing the same thing as Carl, where, you know, folks don't really know, uh, and the opposite side, the, the maybe the hopeful, optimistic side of the industry says, well, the tax credits were just extended just a year ago, with bipartisan support. It already has a sunset provision built in, so how much of a priority is this gonna be for the administration and Congress to target this particular um, you know, tax credit? So you know, maybe not gonna be a top focus. Uh, in any event, um, I think whether uh, the tax credit goes away or maybe uh, another specula uh, speculation, uh, other speculation was that Maybe they push forward the required completion date for renewable projects, um, mm. so limiting the window which the, mm. you know, the um, renewable developers can you know, receive the credits. So whatever happens, uh, at least for Hawaii, and I think this goes to the previous point about, okay, how does the national level policy affect Hawaii level policy? Well, in Hawaii, um, even without the tax credit support, renewables are already cheaper than fossil fuels uh, in Hawaii, and it's Getting that way, um, it's gonna that that trend that shift is is gonna happen sooner than later across the nation, um, and so I think it's again not only because of Hawaii's 100% mandate and its ambitious goals, but also because of the market. Um, Hawaii is still full speed ahead, and it's gonna be up to states like Hawaii and other leaders like again New York and California to show the rest of the nation the way how it's done with clean energy. I think makes you. a really good point about the markets because markets really do drive what goes on in energy. And e even our markets influence Hawaii and Hawaii's markets and policies influence us because we're seeing this rapid growth, figuring out how to do a lot of solar and energy efficiency. I, I don't want to derail the conversation. The thing that scares me would be another war. Um, you know, if if in order to bolster the Defense Department, Mr. Trump starts getting sort of ambitious about getting ourselves into a big conflict and we have economic downturn, that's bad for everybody, just the way renewable energy growth has well, been good for everybody. Yeah, so. I, I, I appreciate you mentioning that because I think it's evident that energy and energy policy is deeply intertwined with geopolitical risk. But right. to, to, to go back to I really wanted to ask both of you, if you, Carl, um, were to take your um, think tank uh, advocate hat off and go back to um, the hat of, an, of a clean and renewable energy company or clean and renewable energy developer on the mainland, and you wanted to do the most that you could to thrive and survive and maximize your success um, in 2017. What would you be thinking and what would you be doing? And you can differentiate if that's you know, between a small company and a large company or, or however you like. Um, I'll add a tinge of politics to it. <laughs> I'd figure out how to get clean energy, renewable solar energy, uh, community solar gardens and community sharing, uh, solar sharing, uh, energy efficiency and storage into the hands and homes of low and moderate income Americans. I'd go straight for Mr. Trump's voters, and I'd show them how a clean energy world would make them more secure, put more money in their pockets, and have them learn to trust that component of the, uh, the progressive agenda. 
that that will that be economically tenable for your business as a, I could not agree more and actually I want to ask Isaac because I think this is a big issue here and also in the mainland but is that is is that a market that's um, ripe to be to be tapped it's an underserved market that's for sure right we, we're assuming that uh, all this stuff starts with the well-to-do and then trickles down but um, yeah people all over the world of the lowest incomes in countries where incomes are much lower than ours participate in financial and market transactions yeah it's I have to yes that is that is <laughs> extremely I, I couldn't agree with you more about this I really couldn't I just want to give Isaac a chance to respond to the yep. same question of um, if you're here in Hawaii, if you are a clean energy company, a clean energy developer, what are you doing, what are you thinking in order to be successful in 2017? Well, it, it just seems like there's something that's hanging over the renewable clean energy industry's head uh, around every corner. Uh, something existential, you know, <laughs> happening, um, whether it's state tax credits or federal tax credits or the end of net metering or, or what have you. Uh, and I think it's still the same situation here. I mean, pedal to the metal, uh, get as far down the field as fast as you can, uh, and like Carl said, expand that base of clean energy adoption as broadly as you can. And frankly, in Hawaii, it's already happening. We have the Costcoization, the home depotification of, <laughs> of solar at this point, and it's really been reaching into sort of traditionally disadvantaged neighborhoods at this point. Well, th that is fantastic. I also know, actually, let it. it uh, I'm tempted to ask. I know that there are some things underway at the commission here um, that are looking to um, empower community-based renewables. And we also have a, um, a GEMS program that is, has a lot of funding for low-income uh, clean energy that has yet been untapped. That's is right. that something that could be a source of... Um... Yes, definitely. There's a tension and opportunity there. Uh, a lot of things are on the plate here in Hawaii, uh, and we're definitely wanting to address that um, underserved market. Well, I can't tell you how happy and excited and pleased it makes me to hear from some of our top experts in the country and the state that the answer is um, clean energy for everybody um, and lower cost energy for everybody, hopefully, ultimately. Um, and that um, pretty much wraps up our show for today. I, could, I really can't thank you enough, um, Carl Robigo um, from Pace Energy and Climate Center, and also thank you so much, Isaac from Earth Justice for joining us today. And please join us again uh, next week at this time again, one o'clock, for another edition of Power Up Hawaii.